Welcome back to the programme. Talking this morning to Neil Tobin about uh, his life and times on the occasion of his 70th birthday, which was actually yesterday. Yeah. But um, if we want to be completely accurate about it, Wesley Burroughs, good morning to you. Hello, Marion. Uh, tell me how you first met Neil. Um, well, I think it was in the, uh, the Because Way. This is a play we did in 1969 at, mm. the, at the Peacock. Mm. And it's always something, something I always wanted to ask Neil, how he did this, because he was playing in Ryan's Daughter in Dingle at the time. And there was a lot of actors waiting around for the right weather and so on. And there was a lot of very serious commuting going on between Dingle and Dublin to play in the Peacock. Yeah. How did you do How it? How did you do it, Neil? I, I, I don't know. I can't remember. But uh, I uh, probably because at that time, th this famous storm that they were waiting for meant that, you know, you could be there and on call every day and then they didn't use you. And, uh, you know, maybe for, for a month you could be there. You were being paid, but... Uh, they still didn't use you, and um, you you would know from the schedule that well they're going to be filming there, there, and there, and there. So that that none of that stuff involves me. So I can uh, play hooky, and uh, you know I can stay away for a couple of weeks. I'm, or maybe I'm, you were well got with the Met Office. Uh, well, no, no, it wasn't that because the storm was a lot of hooey anyway. It was a whole lot of uh, you know publicity and so on. It was it was all a publicity stunt. Right. Because eventually, I think the st the storm was all manufactured anyway at the end, and uh, they got some of the uh, sunsets in South Africa. So you know, <laughs> it was yeah. all conjured together. But wasn't it a good thing for us that the that the storm didn't show up? Because I mean, you did show up every night, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean. It's the least I might do when I was being paid, I suppose. That was the tribes of Gyarth and the tribes of Gob. Yes, yes. That was the, the, the wonderful memory of that play, was it? So it came to pass that the tribes of Gob rose up and smote the tribes of Gyarth. And this goes on for about a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in, in fact, I mean, I think that was probably the first demented clergyman you played. That was... Uh, mm. A demented northern clergyman. Yes, I'm now playing another demented clergyman in a, in another Wesley Burroughs script at the moment. <laughs> That's yeah, true, a yes. A film called Rat, mm. which is uh, not a self portrait wh What is this about demented clergy? Well, is this I've, a vocation uh, missed or anything well, along no, the way? Well, no, I've played a lot of demented priests and, yeah. uh, and, and peculiar, uh, and also a very sane priest in, in Bellicus Angel. But um, I've played a lot of... In fact, at one stage, I mean, I felt like writing on a on a CV, you know, um, you know, what have you played? And I, I felt like, saying, you know, drunks, priests and IRA men. And that would sort of cover all the things. A, a rich vein. Yeah. You're working on a film at the moment, is that right, Wesley? That's right. It, well, I'm not working on it. I finished my work right. a long time ago. Mm. But uh, <clears throat> Neil is working on it. and It's out in Ardmore at the moment. We just finished the location work last week and uh, mm. we hope it'll be done by Christmas. Right. You think he's a workaholic, don't you? Um, what did you say, workaholic? You think <laughs> that, that Neil is a workaholic? Oh, he is. He, is, he, is, he has this tremendous range of skills and he also, um, how do I put this now, he knows his own mind, which means that you never quite get what you expect, but it's usually better, so, so that's okay. Have you had your run-ins with him? No, I haven't personally had any run-ins, but I've heard of some tremendous rows going on, you know, between himself and people who don't know as much as, as, uh, as Neil does. Oh, That's I right. Mean that. Yeah, yeah, you're telling the truth now, Wesley. <laughs> Came up there. Right. Here, here. Let me go to Donald Farmer <laughs> as well. Donald, good morning. Good morning, Marion. You've played the odd mad priest yourself. I have, but none madder than my friend there. And Neil E. Hobin... As you once were translated, the word farmer was once translated by, by a mad Christian brother, not a mad Indeed, priest. Indeed, we met many of those two. Neil, yeah. happy birthday. Thanks, um, Tony, boy. I was working on the way, thinking on the way up, Marion, um, because somebody asked me the other day, and often, people do often ask me about kind of funny incidents that happen, because uh, Neil and I have collaborated uh, well, it, me in a, to, uh, in, 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 a, to, in a smaller capacity to Neil's one man's theatre shows. Yeah. And, pe and people have asked me over the years, you know, uh, he must have lots of uh, funny incidents. <laughs> now, I, I'm stumped about this because I can't remember a single funny incident because I think that since I first met uh, Tobin in the early 60s, this was when I joined RTE, it's been long, one long funny incident. And that's going a long, long way back. And I've, we've had great fun together. I've heard somebody... Uh, talking earlier on in the show about run-ins and everything else. 
I've occasionally, I've occasionally, when he was a little bit exasperated, seen Neil cast his eyes heavenward and mutter, oh dear. <laughs> some fervent wish like that. And sometimes he says very fervently, but otherwise he's meek as a lamb. Meek as a lamb. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> you, you played together in Hamlet, is that right? Well, we were in the same production of yes. Hamlet, but we didn't, our past didn't meet. Neil played the King no. Claudius and I played the, the first grave digger, so. Yes, the last poor Yorick. The last poor Yorick. But we did play together in, uh, and had rather more contact uh, in the field when in the Abbey and uh, yes. subsequently toured to Leningrad and we had some yeah. memories there. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're both Corkonians. Yes, not alone that, we're both from the north side. Yes. Both from the north side. That's sort of a special bond, is it? Oh, ab- mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. We speak the same lingo, you see. That's right. <laughs> we're talking <laughs> this over for the moment because she wouldn't understand you. Well, you're on the north side, north of the river. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> how, how did the one-man shows come about? Well, Neil is better placed to do it, to talk about that than I. Um, uh, but uh, all I know about is that the first one went on in an awful hurry. I think we had about a week and a half left to get it on the show, get it together. That's right. Uh, but Neil would be more... Uh, uh, yeah, how did they start, Neil? Well, I was doing a thing out in the embankment. I was doing uh, about, uh, you know, a, a stand, you know, a one, well, whatever you want to call it, I still, what an hour of uh, comedy and recitations and so on. And uh, this was a, the first time out there. Mick McCarthy was trying out... Um, the, Various yeah. things, you know, he'd uh, he'd had Matt Lamer out there doing the importance of being uh, of Oscar. Amazingly, Michael went out and did it because, uh, and there's a story behind that. He said, "Why should I go out to the Dublin mountains and perform in front of people?" Like and uh, Mick said, "Well, he said, no, Michael, I'll tell you." He said, "Oscar Wilde went out to the west and played in front of cowboys and miners." He said, "And small little bears out," in the <laughs> and Michael said, uh, "All right, point taken." He said, and he went out and he did it. Yeah, did three nights. Quite astonishing. Did, did did three nights out in the old embankment, yeah. Good Lord, I would have thought that we would have regarded that below his station. Well, there you are, but you see, it was the Oscar Wilde. He said, if it was good enough for Oscar Wilde, it's good enough for you, right, because yeah. you're playing Oscar Wilde. <coughs> but, um, no, but I was doing this thing out there in the embankment, and uh, Norman Wisdom was doing uh, a run in the gaiety, and he right. wasn't doing all that well, and he didn't take up his option in the last two weeks. So the gaiety were faced with either going dark or getting something in in a hurry and the only thing they could think of was there was a man called John Lovett Dolan who was a senior counsel and he used to frequent the bar in the gate and he'd seen me out in the embankment and he told Fred O'Donovan and Fred came out and said yeah well can you extend the show to two hours Mm -hmm. and Noel Pearson was my manager and he said yes to three hours if necessary but anyway (laughs) we went (laughs) we, we went in and, uh, you know, they were prepared, to, well, it'll keep the place open, but in fact, it, we actually stuffed the place, and we did two weeks, and you know, it wasn't a single empty seat, That's and right. came back six months later and did another version of it. And continued to come back here for about another ten years after. Exactly, <laughs> uh, but then we used to do it in the Shelburne instead, and... Yeah. Um, so that was how it started. And, it and how did you, how did Donald get involved? How did you get involved, Donald? Well, I got a call from Neil, you see, the Wednesday morning before before the yeah. Monday week, the show was due to open. He said he explained all this to me, what he just explained to you. And uh, he said, well, I need somebody to direct it. So I, I uh, came on board and um, my, my participation in the direction bit of it was, was, was from there on, really, was just uh, well, working with Neil on the script. Um, uh, a great deal of the show was his own. Now, so you're going to be very, very modest now. Actually, he was a huge help in every way because, <laughs> first of all, he was he was would listen to me, you know, which not, lots of other people wouldn't do. And then he would very quietly, in his own way, sort of change all that. But um, then <laughs> he uh, he listened to the material, and he was very, very astute in knowing what would work and what wouldn't work. And uh, when I was being get ca- carried away with my own ego or whatever, or uh, that bits of the material would appeal to me far more than it did to him. And, you know, we sort of worked on that base. And we had a very, very good understanding. Yes, yes. And uh, he would suggest, I mean, he suggested some of the material. And indeed, you know, there was one, one of my favourite ever pieces was, and, um, was a story by Sean O'Fairlein, called Passion, which mm-hmm. we, which I had adapted for the thing, and that yeah. was his idea, and it was a wonderful, wonderful story, and it yeah, gave so a great anchor piece in the middle of the show. 
know it's went well. And can mm-hmm. I just say this now? We're going off shooting in a moment. I'm down here on the farm and uh, outside Braid uh, doing a scene from Glenrow. And but I just wanted to say in relation to that that I know of nobody else. Uh, Neil wrote an awful lot of his own material, quite apart from the stuff we chose from uh, uh, existing writers, as were. Uh, and I have never met yet anyone who could write more pertinent and um, scathing and witty political satire than Neil. I've, it was fabulous, and I've always, in this part of the show, I enjoyed most in the way in the making of it. Uh, and that leads me to back to what I was saying about my collaboration or friendship with him being one long funny incident rather than a succession of small ones. Right. Yeah, okay, listen, Donald, if you have to go, you have to go. Thanks very much indeed. Political satire, there isn't a lot of it around at the moment, is there? Well, there's a lot of comment and so on, but there's... I, satire is not... Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say satire, but uh, comment is what I would use, you know. Yeah. Uh, for instance, in the present situation, uh, oh, 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 I'm not going to offend in any way. But, uh, for instance... Yeah, well, I mean, you can I say... Would, no, but uh, no, what I say, one of the, the ones that I use at the moment, if I go on and say, well, you know, we've had a wonderful series of interesting teaching in this country. We had Garrett Fitzgerald who couldn't tell a lie, we had Charlie Hawley who couldn't tell the truth, and we had Bertie Heron who couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> I, I believe that there is to be a documentary done on the life and times, love affair, I don't know which, uh, of Charlie Hawley and uh, Terry Keane. We were wondering, would you be interested in playing the lead role? Well, I might be interested in doing some of the things that he did in that capacity, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so, no. You don't think no, so? No, I don't think he would approve. Are you shocked and appalled at, at what you're hearing at the moment? I mean, we're kind of, um, we're scandal-weary in a sense now. Or scandal well, I'm approach. not shocked and appalled at anything that I've heard about the said uh, Charlie because, I mean, I have never been a supporter of his and he has known that for a very, very long time. And uh, we had, any time we met, there was a sort of an armed truce. And uh, he was indeed, on a few occasions, very, very gracious to me and, and very civil. Mm. I know what he said when my back was turned, but at least he didn't say <laughs> my face. And uh, we sort of, uh, that's the, the relationship we had. We didn't know each other very well anyway. Right. But, I mean, he did come to me on one occasion here recently. Uh, when there was a tribute to Joe Lynch and Charlie showed up at the end of the thing and he came over to me in the uh, hospitality room and he paid me great compliments and he'd been listening to my tapes down in, in the Alon and uh, that they had whiled away the winter evenings in a way right. that he didn't expect and right. so on. And uh, I said, well, Charlie, I expect the moon to be blue tonight <laughs> if you're giving me compliments, but thanks very much. Why would you expect him not to give you compliments? Well, I mean, I mean, there, you know, there was a political antipathy there, you know. Right, you know. yeah. But if you take what we're hearing now um, yeah. on such a range of things to mm. do with planning, to do with Anspacker offshore accounts, it seems to me, having watched the PAC hearings on Tina G, yeah. that every dog and devil in the country had an offshore account and that if you walked up the stairs, you'd trip over three people who had one. I mean, do, do, because you would have taken a strong view about politics and that. Yeah. Um, does it, does it, do you react to it or do you just kind of shrug your shoulders? Well, no, I'm, I'm very glad that, I mean, I, one thing that I'm very, very wary of, and uh, I even detect a slight note of it in your own question, and that is that, you know, ah, for heaven's sake, they were all at it, you know, and these tribunals are not getting anywhere. And I don't, I don't agree with that. The tribunals have brought out things that the vast majority of people in this country knew nothing about. It has brought out things about um, various governments that, you know, enthusiastic, fanatical supporters of those same governments knew nothing about. And unless they are totally stupid, they have to rethink about, you know, their own allegiance to to those sets of people. Like, hmm. Because I, I don't want to identify it, but, but right. it has had that effect. That It has dug out some of the truth and hinted at an awful lot more. That may or may not ever come out, but I mean... Yes, but the interesting thing is that while uh, a lot of it, of the, the stuff that come out has obviously reflected badly on Fianna Fáil, mm-hmm. they're, they're flying high in the, in the popularity polls. Well, see, this is more of it. They're not really, you know. I mean, if you look at the actual figures in the last polls, the headlines said they were flying high, but they're not. 
you think that it no. is affecting people's allegiance? I mean, what, what the poll showed was that uh, that if if the figures remained the same in a general election, yeah. that Fianna Fáil and the PDs could go back to, uh, together again. Mm. Uh, but only barely, I think. Right. You well, know. I mean, they're only barely there at the yeah, moment. Yeah, but I mean, g just going on the things. And yeah. you see, some of the independents... Uh, who got in on, on specific, for specific reasons to do with sort of television aerials and so on. Oh, once these problems are ironed out, if they are, and if they are ironed out before the next election, then they as candidates lose the reason for going forward. Mm. Um, and God knows where those votes will go. Right. Mm. So you're, sa you're sanguine about the way things are going? Sanguine. I mean, you you take the view that what is happening is good and that it's good for us and healthy and oh, all I of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I I had expected that you would have a greater sense of outrage than you. I would would have thought from from your own politics or no, your own no. Well, I uh, you see, you're only outraged if you find out something that you didn't know anything about. Right. But I mean, what I feel is a sort of sad satisfaction that what I thought all along has now proven to be true. Right. And I mean, that's no, that's no real sort of thing to call. C cause for celebration. No. no. Right. Okay, let me go to somebody else who wants to talk to you. Uh, Tony Doyle, good morning to you. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm very good indeed. Tell me about this man. Well, you're allowed to wish him a happy birthday first. I tell you this much. If he agrees to play Terry Keane, I will play Charlie Hoy. <laughs> 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 That'll go down a tree. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good morning to you and happy birthday to you. Get back in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you even have birthdays anymore. I gave them up years ago. I know you did, yes. You know, we, yeah. we are... Well, even if you had them, you didn't invite me to them, but anyway. <laughs> we are men opposed, you and me, and it's time yeah. something yeah. stopped. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Where are you? you? How did I'm, you get time off from work for three minutes? I mean, because you never <laughs> stop working, morning, noon or night. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. <laughs> I am uh, yeah. sitting at home about to take my daughter to school, actually. Ah, oh, well. So, anyway, it's lovely to hear you. And, and you and, too. Uh, yeah, and... Um, you asked Neil, I gather, at yeah. once for, for directions in New York. Is that right? I did. I had never been to New York. I had to go um, to a wedding, a family wedding there last year. And I, I asked him how do you manage to get from New York, from John Kennedy into center of New York. And he told me to ring up a friend of his. Uh, he had a cab in New York. So I said to him, well, I'll need two cabs because there are six of us going. Mm. So um, he, uh, he said, does he have a minibus or a people carrier or something like that? He said, well, just give him a ring and he'll sort you out. So I rang the man. He met me at the airport. We walked out of JFK into the car park, and he opened the booth of this gleaming black stretch limo with a glass roof. So we had a midnight drive around Manhattan, thanks Back. to Mr. Uh, Tobin. Is that your standard way of getting around it, is? <laughs> yes. Yes. He, he have style, I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, this man happens to be a friend of mine, and he does own a limo, <laughs> and so on. But uh, I do have to pay him, though. Oh, well, sorry. I hope you get the bill quite soon. Actually, because I forgot <laughs> to <laughs> if you were talking to folk who didn't know Neil Tobin, mm -hmm. Tony, how, what, how would you describe him? What would you say about him? Watch it, Doyle. I'd say, watch your back. <laughs> <laughs> Approach him from the front. <laughs> and never from the side. <laughs> what else would you say? Uh, I would say he's a lovely, warm, generous person and enjoy his company is what I'd say. Right. That's, you, you can't get any better than that. Oh, Tony, I'm so moved. <laughs> I look forward to Anyone working with you again. Anyone would think you meant it. Yes, uh, I do mean it. Well, sure, you do, do, don't you work together? We, we do. do. I look forward to the next time. All oh, yeah. right. Oh, yeah. Well, the way you and said you know, that, listen, I thought it was by the, the way, dim and Tony, distant future. Yeah. Before you go, yeah. I got information recently yeah. that uh, Murphy Stoke is to be released on video before Christmas. Is it now? Yeah, so they say. You remember we were both I looking do for indeed. copies of the day. Yes, right? indeed. Well, you better check your video rights because uh, they were a bit slow in paying the um, Australian fee last time it was transmitted. And indeed the Irish fee as well. Yeah, and yeah. Cyprus. Cyprus and is Cyprus, up in yeah. arms about it. Uh, Cyprus is up in arms about it too. Do you, about know, stroke, yes. do, you know, do you know a good dodgy accountant in Dublin? <laughs> <laughs> do you know a good straight one even? <laughs> I think you're getting us into trouble now. I, I think. But carry on. In truth, Murphy Stroke, did it give the pleasure 
to you that it did to the rest of us when we watched it. It certainly did. It oh, certainly I think did. so, yeah. It was, it was wonderful. Well, I tell you, I, what I remember was that at the very first reading, uh, Frank Satanovich, who was the uh, director and who was actually a Canadian of Yugoslav extraction, but crazy about horses in all shapes and forms. But what he said was, uh, now he said, there's one message in this script, he said, at the end of this uh, transmission, he said, I want every punter in Britain standing on his chair and shouting, Good old Murphy! <laughs> he said, that is the object of this, you know. Yeah. yeah. And it was played in that spirit. It, you know, and, and, I, and I have no doubt yeah. that they were doing just that. Yeah. Sorry, just for the benefit of viewers who wouldn't have seen it, yeah. it was about a betting coup, very cleverly done. Yeah, it was about the gay future betting coup where they, uh, this man Murphy, whom I mentioned earlier, having played in Tony Murphy. Yeah. Uh, he he got a horse, um, kept its form secret, trained it secretly, sent it over to Scotland and when it was ready and then they ran it uh, with totally false form uh, in Cartmel and by various means, by blocking up telephones and sending people to uh, bookie shops all over London, um, they, they managed to keep the price up to 10 to 1 even though money was going on in rakes and the horse won. And uh, they stood to win, well, at the time, was a, it was 1974, I mm. think, a huge, I mean, they, they stood to win about a half a million pounds, yeah. which was huge money then. But uh, the bookies refused to pay on the grounds that it was a coup, you know, that it, and uh, it went to court, and uh, the judge found that, well, he said, if it's a conspiracy, you say it's a criminal conspiracy to keep the price up, the bookies conspired to keep the price down. So... Um, he said it's two sides of the one coin, but the jury found Murphy guilty, and he was only fined a thousand pounds, which wasn't, you know, he got away with it to some extent. But he went, um, you know, he became famous yeah. and so on. But a lot of people did collect their money because some of the bookies did pay, pay up, some of the smaller bookies did actually right. pay up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my recollection of it was that the punter won rather than the bookies. I mean, then that that was why people would be standing on their chairs saying yes or whatever. Well, but he himself lost. Um, he lost his stake, I suppose. Yeah. He, he had a couple it, of grand. This was it. all based on true story. That oh, was yeah, the point of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the whole did thing. you knock a bit of sport out of that, Tony? Um, I did, actually. Uh, the truth was that the judge said that no criminal offence had been committed because uh, no law of the land had been contravened. Yeah. But the jury said that there did appear to be the slightest conspiracy to defraud the bookies. <laughs> And yeah. in consequence of that, he was fined a thousand pounds. I thought yeah. that's what bookies and punters were all about. Well, but it's bookies, also said that's that what Colonel, bookies do to punters. Yeah, well, Colonel George Wig, who was yeah. the the head of the the racing board in England, yeah. it, it was said to uh, allegedly he said to the policeman, the head, you know, the superintendent, whatever he was, who was investigating, he said, "I want, I'm not going to have the racing game brought into this dispute by a bunch of bloody paddies." So, and that this was transmitted to the jury and that it was actually a kind of anti-Irish thing. But uh, I would say simply that they were unlucky that there were no punters on, on, the, on, on the, the jury. jury. Yeah. Mm. What a unanimous <laughs> one there. Anyway, it is coming out, is it again on video? Well, that's what I was told. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, great. Listen, Tony, thank yes, you very indeed. much for talking to us. Well, uh, it's a pleasure. And, um, sorry, I can't be there for the party afterwards, the coffee and croissant. That's right. <laughs> croissant? We're in RTE now at the right. moment, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, anyway, but if that, okay. film, if that film comes off, as you suggest, I'll see you in bed. Excellent, in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go and get ready. Tony, good morning and thank you. All the best. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Neil, for about 30 years, would like to wish Neil a happy birthday. He's one of the most underrated actors in this country. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, uh, you heard what the man said. I mean, I'm not going to deny it. He, no, he sounds like he's a very good friend of yours. John knows Neil for about 30 years. I know John Garrity. John who? John Garrity. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And would like to wish you a happy birthday. I would have thought you were one of the highest rated. In that, I mean, you've done such an extraordinary range um, both in like in film and theatre. What is it you said? You said you've done everything bar ballet and yeah, striptease. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you haven't done that yet, well, mind you. Sure, listening to you Tony talking Doyle to Tony, has plans, you never yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but do you feel that you're underrated? In any Not way? really. No, no, no. Not overall. I don't. No, no. 
You're sure about that now? We need to know that if you thought that you were. Well, no, I'm not. No, not, not overall. I mean, I feel that people have underrated me in the past, but a lot of them have made up for it. In what kinds of uh, things? I, uh, I gather it was once in the field you figured that people spoke about the field afterwards as if you had had no part in it. Well, I was airbrushed out of it. You know, I was, they did a kind of a Jack Lynch on me because that was for reasons that had nothing, you know, to do really with the performance or anything like that. It mm. was just sort of... Uh, it was, uh, I think, commercially more um, more um, appropriate, not to mention the fact that I'd played it. Mm. On, on the international uh, material, like the films, and uh, I'm thinking of Bride's Head, and thinking of, I can't think of the ones at, at the moment that come to mind. Which of those stand out for you? Um, well, Bride's Head, that was, that, was, that was a wonderful experience. Must because, I mean, I had a long, long scenes on my own with uh, Olivier dying, yeah. you know, and it was wonderful to watch him because he was in very, very bad health at the time. And uh, the funny thing was that everybody was saying, oh, you know, he's, you know, a few months now, you know. And uh, it looked, uh, he, he could hardly walk at that stage. Really? And yet two years later, I was in another film with him out in Vienna and he was walking around like a two-year-old. Yeah. He'd made a complete recovery. Yeah. And um, I don't know what it was. It was some sort of... Um, you know, he had kind of shakes and so on. And yeah. even in bed, with all the lights on and everything, between takes, they used to have to put mittens on him because his hands were so cold. Good Lord. Mm. Amazing. But he still wanted to work on. Yeah. And um, he was... Um, he he couldn't. Uh, he said, "Amazing, tour de force." He said, "All, all that Latin." He said, and I said, "I was an altar boy." He said, "Oh well, doesn't matter, you know." <laughs> Still, you remember it, you know. Uh, Is it a buzz? To that was play? another priest incident. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's yeah. another priest. Yeah. 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 Is it a buzz to play with somebody who, in another jurisdiction, shall we say? Uh, is so well respected. Oh yeah, no, it was wonderful. It was, yeah. it was really, it was you know, it was thrilling because I mean, he was the legend. And when I was young, I mean, you, if you wanted to be, a, if I want to be another Laurence Olivier. You know, yeah. he was the only big actor he was, whose name. I mean, even at that time, people like Gil Goodwood were still to come. Yeah, you know? was he generous? He was. Yes, was he? He was. Yeah. yeah. He was indeed, yeah. very much. No, unlike some, I yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, let me go to your daughter, Fina. Good morning to you. Good morning, Marion. How are you? And where are you at this very moment? I'm in New York. You're in New York. You've got the bug too, haven't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. <laughs> Both for the acting and for New York. Yes, this, this is true, this is true. And I yeah. p possibly, possibly both somewhat inherited, but uh, yeah. yeah. I, I definitely, I think, picked up the love of New York also from my dad. That's right. Yep. Tell me about him from your perspective. Well, um, I guess, it, it, you know, um, he's, he, as far as I'm concerned, he's just dad and he's wonderful. But uh, growing up with him was uh, it kind of, you know, it's one of these things where it slowly dawns on you that your dad doesn't do a run-of-the-mill kind of a job, you know. And uh, over time, it, it, it slowly sinks in. But I don't think it ever it really dawned on me until, uh, like, in the 70s when he was doing the television shows and it was... If the Capsets came first, and then there was Time Now, Mr. T. And around then, I think it dawned on me that I was probably the only girl in school who saw her dad on telly on a regular basis. And then uh, later on again, it dawned on me that I was definitely the only girl in school who'd ever seen her dad in drag. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm going to interrupt here, Fiona, because uh, I want to boast about her, you see, because <laughs> she has been understudying the part of the girl in The Weir, on Broadway for the last five or six months and two weeks ago she got to play the part on Broadway for two performances and that makes her the second to be to appear in a Broadway play. Congratulations so, Fina. So Thank you very much. <laughs> How did it go for you? Oh it went great. I had a, an absolute ball. I'm working with a, a wonderful cast of people in a terrific play with a part that, you know, actors who just uh, die to play, you know. Right. Was fabulous. She was absolutely terrific in it. I wasn't there, but I mean, a friend of mine... And I do have a name drop in here. He is actually the press officer for Mayor Rudy Giuliani. And he went to see it and he took the trouble to ring us and tell us that she was absolutely fantastic. That's, for, that, and, that's, that's terrific. And press officers never tell a lie. <laughs> Congratulations. Because presumably when you're understudy, there's a frustration about that, is there? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to, you've got to, you, you've got to, you got the two things going on at once. The one is you don't want anything bad to happen to anyone. Yes. <laughs> and then the other is that you're hoping that you get to go on. Right. But luckily, you know, Michelle take a little vacation. Well, now you so. can wish him a happy birthday. Oh, well, absolutely. Happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Now, for a man that gave up the drink, mm. how long are you off the drink now? 26 years. 26 years. Was that yeah. hard? Uh, not after the first six months. Not really. No? No. no. You, you do what other people go to for entertainment. I gather that your joy uh, is in golf. That's right, yeah. When did you take that up? Oh, I always played golf. I mean, but when I stopped drinking, I, I, I sort of intensified my assaults on the white ball. And, um, you know, contrary to rumour, I actually am quite a decent golfer. Is that right? Oh, yes. Oh, well, yes. I'm I mean, I can play to my handicap. You know, unlike others who, who um, can play well above the handicap, uh, or well below the handicap, I mean, you know. Yeah, right. In other words, I'm not a bandit. Not really. <laughs> okay, okay. What is your handicap? At the moment, 20. 20? Yeah. Right. Well, now, what we have for you this morning is a gift voucher from McGurk's, which is on the occasion of your birthday. McGurk's got to wish you oh. a very happy birthday, so I hope you spend it well. Thank you. And uh, thank you very, very much indeed for coming in. Can and I just say one thing before I go? Yeah. I'm doing a new show in the Gaiety next March called uh, Sweet and Sour Grapes. Booking is already open and it'll be a great show. Right. I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. Okay. Congratulations Thanks, and Marianne. happy birthday to you. All Marianne. the best. Neil Cobain. Bye.